Daniel 10. The third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, and the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. See, right away you got the idea that it's not for Daniel's time, but it's out somewhere in the future. The time appointed was long, or great, or far off. And he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three, four weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine upon my mouth, and neither did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. He's fasting and praying, of course. And in the four and twentieth day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittico, then I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with fine gold, of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Well, I'll give you one guess who he's talking about. <laughs> Sounds like Revelation 1, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men that were with me saw not the vision, but a great quaking fell upon them, so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw the great vision, and there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard... Yet heard I the voice of the words, and when I heard the voice of the words, then was I in a trance, or a deep sleep, on my face uh, toward the ground. Again, as I think I mentioned last week, you often see that uh, when you get into the realm of the spirit, uh, the body can't take it. Uh, it's, it's real drain on the physical strength. And Daniel, over more than once, speaks of the fact that he fainted in some of the tremendous visions he had. And verse 10 says, Behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. That's as far up as he got. <laughs> hands and knees. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for far from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. In other words, he says, at the beginning of the three weeks, he says, your prayer was heard at the beginning of the three weeks. Well, why did he have to pray for three weeks? What well, he tells you in verse 13, For the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days, that is, for the three weeks. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now, this prince of the kingdom of Persia is not the king of Persia. This is the satanic spirit that's over uh, the... Uh, kingdom of Persia. Behind every world government, government there is a, uh, there are the rulers of the darkness of this world, Ephesians 6.12. The governments are not in the hands of men, but in the hands of the powers of darkness. These worlds, these governments, as Jesus said, belong to Satan. They are his. The whole world lies in the hand of the wicked one. And remember when Satan offered Jesus the kingdoms of this world for worship of him, Jesus didn't say, you can't offer them to me because they already belong to me. But he could offer them to Jesus because they belong to Satan. He has usurped them, they're his. And of course, it's obvious it couldn't have been a real temptation if he had offered something that already belonged to him. And Jesus suffered real temptation. He wasn't playing a game there in the uh, 40 days of the temptation in the wilderness. So this is a, the Prince of Persia is, is the there's the ruler that stands behind the literal king of Persia, or the physical one. And to show you, of course, he isn't talking about the literal prince because he calls Michael, who is the archangel in Scripture, mentioned several times. He says Michael is one of the chief princes. So the princes he's talking about here are angelic princes. Or literally, that word prince is not the best translation. The word literally means ruler. He says the ruler 
of the kingdom of Persia, and Michael is one of the chief rulers. And so uh, Daniel's prayer was hindered for three weeks until the most powerful angel in heaven, Michael, came and uh, through battle uh, in the spiritual realm broke through with the answer. So if you want to know why some of the answers to your prayers for healing or uh, whatever the need may be, whatever you're claiming, why they're delayed, you've got, you've got plenty of evidence right here why they're delayed. Some of you give up when uh, you should be battling by faith, battling the spirit forces, praying in the spirit. See, Daniel kept praying. I don't mean he kept repeating his prayer. He kept praying, fasting and praying. If he'd have given up, why well, Michael wouldn't have come to deliver the answer. So verse 14 says, Now I'm come to make thee to understand what shall befall thy people. When? In the latter days. So all of these prophecies we're showing you are for our day, <coughs> not for Daniel's. And the vision is yet for many days. And when he had spoken such words unto me, I set my face toward the ground, and I became dumb. Behold, one like the similitude of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spake and said unto him that stood before me, <clears throat> O my Lord, by the vision, my sorrows are turned upon me, and I have retained no strength. But how can the servant of this my Lord talk with this my Lord? As for me, straightway there remained no strength in me, neither was there breath left in me. Then <clears throat> there came again, and touched me, one like the appearance of a man, and he strengthened me, and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not, peace be with thee, be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened, and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee, and now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia? And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Greece shall come. You see, so uh, after, see, Daniel's living during the Babylonian period. Now, we've already showed you that. If you're new here, you'll just have to get the tapes because we can't keep repeating, you know, what, what we're talking about in these areas. Uh, it's just by the nature of it, you never get done. Daniel lives during the Babylonian period, and he's already getting a prophecy about the Persian period. And then he's, this, the angel says, that I broke through the opposition of the powers of darkness, the prince over Persia, and got through with the answer. But he says now, he says, I'm going to next, I'll be warring against the, the demons that are controlling the kingdom that shall come, the kingdom of Greece. Mm -hmm. So he's already anticipating. You see, the, the, the powers that control and work behind the scenes are the things that, uh, that we have to break through. And... Um, uh, so he's already anticipating another battle. When I will show thee that which is noted, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. Now verse 1 goes with chapter 10. Whoever divided chapters up, as somebody said, did it riding on horseback with a pencil in his hand. Every time the horse went up and came down, he, he said, that's a verse. This is a chapter. I mean, it, it can really mix you up if you're a serious student of the Bible. So verse 1 stays right with that, or you don't know what he's talking about. Also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. So this angel says that, that he's strengthening the kings, just as the powers of darkness try to, to influence them and direct them, so the good spirits also try to influence and direct them. You see the, that, uh, that uh, the return of the Jews to their land was a result of Cyrus, I think we've mentioned this, of Cyrus issuing a decree to allow them to go back. Now Cyrus was a heathen king, and so somebody had to influence him for good because he let his own prisoners, his own captives, go back and establish their land even though they had rebelled against, uh, against their ones who had conquered them. Now that brings us to the prophecy which starts in verse 2. All of that was what Daniel experienced and the battling with the spirit forces in order uh, for them, for the angels to get through to give him 
the prophets in vision, and angels are the ones who minister visions and prophecies. Uh, I mean, this is the way it is. The Holy Spirit, of course, is the one in us, but it's the, the angels are ministering spirits. If the Lord has me call a person out, you see, there's an angel telling me which one of you it is. Now, I, whether you know that or understand it doesn't particularly matter to me, but that's the way it is. I'm just telling you how it is. Sometimes the angel is seen. Uh, and when I lay a hand on a person, it works the same for anyone ministering. I'm just telling my experience. Uh, for healing, there's an angel that ministers that healing. That's what they're for. And so the angel ministers. When you have a vision, it's an angel giving you a vision. Uh, this is their ministry. You see, a vision can be of the past. It's not of a thing that's actually taking place. It may have already taken place, or it may be future. And so in the realm of the spirit, they can so operate in your spirit that the natural realm uh, blanks out in the spiritual realm. Uh, you're in it. And they're giving, it's just like a moving picture, giving you a... But I was praying the other day and asked the Lord, I often ask him for some word or some revelation to go with the message he's already given me. And so I was praying the other day. And so he gives me a very, sometimes my visions often are just real sharp, just like that. And you got to get it. If you miss it, you miss it. <laughs> So he gave me a confirmation of that, but it's an angel that ministers it. And so that's why, uh, this is just a part of, uh, I'm throwing it in extra, but it's just a part of the understanding of what God is doing in this end time. As you get in scripture, it's not something we're making up, it, it, it is right here in scripture. These angels are ministering these things, you see, to Daniel. And you'll find this over in uh, Revelation. The John, these things were ministered to him by angels. The vision, the whole book of Revelation. Remember when he tried to worship one of them? He said, wait a minute, no. He said, I'm just giving you the prophecy and the vision. I'm, I'm like you, worship God. I'm just, uh, in fact, he called himself a prophet. He was, uh, it was not really an angel. Here was a, here was a prophet. Which uh, gets into area I don't want to get into, but see here, here are even prophets ministering. You don't stop being a prophet when you get on the other side. How many of you know what I'm talking about here? <laughs> Revelation. Yeah, well, where, where, that, where John fell down before this person ministering this vision in Revelation to him. He says, no, I'm, I'm like you. I'm of your brother, brethren, the prophets. See, John was a prophet too. He says, I'm what you are. I'm a prophet, except I'm over on this side, and I look so much better than you. <laughs> you thought I ought to be worshipped. <laughs> So we come to the uh, <clears throat> to the prophecy. Now I'll just tell you what the first thirty-four verses are, because we're not going to read those. Those are, and you could profitably read them on the basis of what we've already studied in chapters two, seven, eight, and nine. But these are past events, future to Daniel, but past to us. For example, verse 2, Now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. And a mighty king shall stand up, and he shall rule with great dominion, and do according to his will. And when he shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven. Now if you can remember the other prophecies and visions he's talking here about Alexander the Great a great king he says when he is destroyed then four kingdoms arise remember the four horns that came out of that third beast well he says his kingdom is divided toward the four wings of heaven so he so here's another chapter 11 another repetition of the same prophecy that started back there in Nebuchadnezzar's dream so you've got it repeated here in chapter 11 so we're not going to go through that because it's a repetition so you've got chapters 2, 7, 8, and uh, 11 dealing with the same prophecy. Chapter 9 was a prophecy of 70 weeks, which was bigger in scope. <clears throat> and you come down to verse uh, 21. All the other is past history to us. Well, so is this for that matter, but... Uh, up until verse uh, 21, you've got the, the uh, 
kingdom of Persia and Greece described and all of that dividing up of those kingdoms that we studied. But beginning with verse 21 is this character we saw last week from uh, uh, Daniel 8, a Antichus Epiphanes, who is a type in, in Daniel of the Antichrist. And his career and his persecution of the Jews is described in verses 21 to 35. Again, you can read that and you'll see it's talking about this one who uh, we discussed already, who is a type of Antichrist. But now our point and purpose this morning is to get to verse 36 because beginning here, you have this peculiar phenomenon in prophecy that prophecy will suddenly switch into another age or realm or personality dealing with another personality and you're not always warned of it. That's why that uh, you, we need to study the word uh, because you, you have to know the nature of prophecy. And so beginning in verse 36, you have events that move beyond Antiochus Epiphanes and describe one who's called the willful king. And here and again, it's old Antichrist himself again being described. Uh, this figure described in Daniel 7 and 8 and here in chapter 11 and then again uh, throughout the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians, Revelation 13, so forth. Antichrist. And uh, the order of end time events uh, that are listed here uh, are, are out of harmony with anything that, that ever happened in, under the career or reign of Antiochus Epiphanes, the one who's described in verses 21 to 35. So what we've got here is a description of Antichrist because things said of him here, as we'll see, are said of Antichrist in the other passages that we've already studied. Secondly, uh, the opening of chapter 12, and again, Daniel didn't write in chapters. This, if, if this would be written the way Daniel got it, you'd have 10 to 12 as a prophecy. 10, chapters 10, 11, and 12. But with the opening of chapter 12, you get the... Uh, you get a repetition of the time context. Remember back in Daniel 10, 14, it, he said, I'm giving you a vision and a prophecy concerning the latter days. And so 12, 1 shows us again that he's talking about the latter days in this context, beginning with verse 36 of chapter 11. For he says, at, the, at that time shall Michael stand up. Here's Michael again the great prince which stands for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble. This is the great tribulation we've already studied, such as has never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Now verse 1 of chapter 12 says, At that time, now at what time? Well, the time of the events beginning with verse 36, because up to ver through verse 35, it's history. But from 36 on, this has never happened. As anybody who just wants to take the trouble enough to try to check out the events in history, can trace them up through verse 35. In fact, I give them in detail in our book on Daniel and uh, the prophets. The detail, because uh, everything he says in verses 1 to 35 of chapter 11, you can name the kings and the events and what he's talking about. But beginning with verse 36, you've got events that have never happened. You can't fit them into any other time. So they must be future. So verse 1 of chapter 12 says, at that time, what time? The latter days. And how do we know it's the latter days? Because he says, then the dead will be raised. So we know it's the latter days. You know it again. And the, uh, uh, the great tribulation will be poured out upon here. So <clears throat> uh, we said all that to say, verse 36 begins the latter days after uh, that fourth kingdom that we've been studying. The Roman Empire uh, comes into existence, which it did after the Greek Empire. Now let's look at this king. You'll see he's talking about not anybody but this supernatural figure, Antichrist, which is to appear 
in the generation in which we live. Verse 36, he says, A king will arise who will do according to his will. <coughs> now right away, you've got somebody unique, you see. If you learn a little about prophecy and how to interpret, and it's not hard as you think it may be, uh, you can see context change this way. Uh, if you will read verses 1 to 35, then right away, here's somebody else coming on the scene. And the king shall do according to his will. And uh, he will exalt himself. And notice he's talking about Antichrist. He exalts himself above God, as these other passages have taught us. He will exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. And he shall speak great things against the God of gods. And he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. That is the tribulation, just in other words for tribulation. He will prosper until the tribulation is passed. For that that is determined shall be done. So in verses, uh, well, let's read 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. So it's not uh, an angel he's talking about. He's talking about a human, but who is uh, a special figure. He will not regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all, all gods. Now, go back to 2 Thessalonians 2. We've pointed to many times, and uh, just, we're not going to read all the passage about Antichrist. Here you have the same thing said of Antichrist. Uh, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself he is God. Revelation 13 says the same thing, he'll speak great things against God. Daniel 7 says the same thing, he'll speak great things against God. Well, so you know who he's talking about here. In chapter 11, this isn't Antiochus Epiphanes, but the one that he typified. He's this willful king that does according to his own will. So a king will arise who will do according to his own will. Verse 40, it's the latter days, for it says at the time of the end. Then, the, then he describes certain events. At the time of the end, the king of the south will come against him, and the king of the north will come against him. But it's at the time of the end. And uh, as we've already pointed out, in verse 1 of chapter 12, Daniel 10, 14, it says it's in the latter days, the day, the time of the resurrection, when this person comes into view. Now, Antichrist goes on and defeats them, these kings that come against him. Remember, in the other visions and prophecies, when the little horn came forth, he uprooted horns coming up. He displaces kings. So these kings he defeats. He says, At that time shall the king of the south push at him. The king of the north shall come up against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall also enter into the glorious land. Now that's the holy land again, Palestine. Called in scripture the glorious land. He shall enter into Palestine and many countries shall be overthrown. But three will escape, Edom, Moab, and Ammon. So he, he overcomes this opposition, moves into Palestine. Then his headquarters is set up in Jerusalem. Verse 45, he shall plant the tabernacles of his palaces between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, which, of course, in Scripture is Mount Zion. And remember in 2 Thessalonians 2, we just read that he sits in the temple of God and calls himself God. So uh, the temple, of course, is on Mount Zion, the holy mountain. But he's going to come to his end. He shall come to his end, and none shall help him. That's what is said of him in chapter 7. He is destroyed utterly. That's what's said of him... Uh, in chapter 8, he's destroyed and nobody's going to help him. That's what's said of him in Revelation 19. He is utterly destroyed and cast in the lake of fire. So you put all that together, you've got Antichrist coming on the scene again. Now, you can, you can 
study that in connection with the other chapters. What you need to do after this study is sit down and read 2, 7, 8, 9, and then 10 to 12 all together, and it'll all begin to fit into place because all of these are one prophecy given over and over in various forms. Just like the end time move and purpose of God, some get a I'll get a vision, somebody over here will get a vision, somebody else will have a prophecy, and we just get parts of it, and you put it all together. Well, that's why you have, uh, rather than chapter 2 just giving everything and all the details, uh, you have practically half of the book of Daniel or more dealing with the same things. But various details are set forth. <clears throat> now, since uh, the prophecy is of end-time events, uh, then we're going to we're going to deal with them. Now you notice here in verse uh, one or verses one to three of Daniel, you have three great end time events described that we are getting ready to witness: the great tribulation, the resurrection, literally resurrections plural, because that's the way the Bible speaks of them, and judgments plural. Uh, three great end time events. We've already looked at the Great Tribulation. We've studied that in connection with uh, the other prophecies months ago even. And we're not going to deal with that anymore except to mention where it's fitting. But uh, we want to <clears throat> begin uh, a deep study of uh, what he speaks of here in verse 2. In the context of the time of trouble, verse 2, many of them, he didn't say all of them, notice, many of them that sleep in the dust shall awake. Some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Two resurrections right there. Some will awake. I don't want to deal with the two resurrections today. I don't think I'll get that far, but uh, I want to deal with... Uh, the subject of resurrection here. Uh, now Daniel simply sets it forth, but you get the full teaching, or fuller teaching, because it isn't the full teaching, uh, but the fuller teaching over in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, and then John is given great revelation on resurrection in the book of Revelation. So you've got three passages we'll have to look at. And you'll be surprised what's on in, in Scripture on resurrection. I know you'll be surprised. Now, if you turn over to 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to begin there. Uh, we're going to deal with this whole chapter. We're, we're living in a time again when, uh, uh, as in the days of Jesus, you know, the Sadducees denied the doctrine or the truth of the resurrection. And, uh, today it's popular again, the modernists and the seminaries. Uh, you'll have professors that don't believe in a bodily resurrection spiritual one. Southern Baptist Theological Seminary is no exception. That's where I attended. Now, I don't say they all believe that there, but I, there, there was, I know of one professor in particular would never make a clear statement on the bodily resurrection, physical resurrection. Uh, you know the distinction, the, what I'm talking about, do you? That the, the liberal modern view is that the body isn't raised, but you die and your spirit goes back to God and that's the resurrection of your spirit but Jesus told them they didn't know the power of God or the scriptures they were ignorant and and today we call them scholars in our seminaries who teach these things but Paul calls them fools over in verse 35 verse 36 look he says thou fool <laughs> He said it. I guess he can get away with it. The reason he writes 1 Corinthians 15, there are people in Corinth who I have listened to some Sadducees teaching, Sadducean teaching, or somewhere they picked up the idea that there's no resurrection. And they were in the church. So you can uh, find all kinds of people in the church. And so he writes 1 Corinthians 15, inspired the Spirit to answer that. But in so doing, he sets forth profound truth on the resurrection of the body, which is what Daniel is talking about, and which is what uh, uh, Revelation 12 and 20 are talking about. An event which we're going to see uh, come to pass. Now, keep this in mind. 
when I talk about resurrection, I'm talking about uh, uh, changing also, uh, as Paul does in 1 Corinthians 15, verse, uh, look at verse uh, 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. For in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, and we shall be changed. So when we speak of resurrection, we're not just talking about the dead being raised. We're talking about us being raised in the sense we're changed immediately, just like that. <coughs> Maybe sometime while we're talking about it, just happened. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's going to happen. <clears throat> so I'm not talking about just the dead who will be raised, but resurrection includes the whole catching up, too. I'm talking not just about being raised, but being caught up with Christ in the clouds. And a purpose that didn't say anywhere but the clouds, as you know, because there's a catching up and a changing and a coming back. When we, when we talk about being caught up and changed and come back, I, I don't have time, if you haven't heard <laughs> what we're talking about there, to go back and say, well, here's the scriptures for all of this. Because there are three, four scriptures that say you're not going to heaven, friends, when you're caught up. You're going to the clouds and you're coming back with Jesus. I know that messes up some of your songs and your hymns <laughs> and what you've been taught uh, as, as truth. And I can, I can feel in my spirit some of you tremble when I say it. You, literally, literally you do. I'm very sensitive and I can feel you trembling. I can point some of you out. Even this morning. Just because it's Baptist doctrine, Presbyterian doctrine, fundamentalist doctrine, whatever doctrine it is you're holding to, uh, you think, even when you quote scripture, how can it be so? Should I believe it? Dare I trust it? <laughs> well, praise the Lord. Thank God that the early church didn't need proof texts for everything that was said, or they'd have never spoken in tongues because... When Peter said, they said, what meaneth these tongues? He says, that's Joel's prophecy. They said, wait a minute. Joel didn't say a word about speaking in tongues, and he doesn't. Pentecost would have never happened. Because 3,000 believed his word without a proof text, other than the general statement that in the last days I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, 3,000 believed and started speaking in tongues. So, <clears throat> spirit knows two or three at least of you need that. If you think I don't know who you are, you come to me after and say, was that me? I'll, I'll tell you right away. <laughs> and two of your men. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's right. You see, as I, uh, my pet phrase is, God doesn't put dummies in the pulpit. He doesn't. I mean, seminary sometimes. <laughs> and so uh, I don't stand up here not knowing sometimes what you're thinking. That becomes a bit of a problem sometimes to <laughs> plow through that. But, but bear with it. I mean, uh, you, and I'm not just talking about somebody that's new here, so don't you get on the spot. I'm talking about some of you that are not new here. That just what I just said about not being caught up to heaven, but being caught up to the clouds, and you find me one verse that says you're going to be caught up to heaven. You've got the only teaching, you're caught up into the clouds with Jesus. And in the same place he says it, he says he's bringing the saints back with him. Get into the word and quit, quit struggling over these verses. Bless your hearts. <clears throat> you're, not, you're just not going to be a part of this unless you quit struggling with it. You see, unbelief will not get you in it because Brother Freeman was here for two years and you heard it. And you, uh, when the bridegroom comes, you don't have the oil in your vessel and you'll knock on the door and, you, and uh, Jesus will say, well, who is it? Well... You say, uh, we're part of the bride. We're part of the virgins. He, he'll say, I don't know you. Uh, well, I'll say, but, but you, you preached and prophesied in our streets. We listened to you. That's what they, uh, one of the parables say to Jesus. So because I've been here, don't mean you're going to be a part of it. Now, you need this admonition. Because uh, I don't waste time with these things unless they are needed. 
you're not going to be a pirate because you heard Brother Freeman teach, and some of you would use that. You'd say, well, I sat and listened to him two or three years. It's whether or not you get a hold of it and by faith go on. Mm -hmm. And you see, faith, faith requires that you become a part of it, not just sitting on the sidelines listening. Amen. Get a hold of it and start, start letting it be a part of you and start telling others about it. You don't really believe it if you're going to wait and see if it's going to happen the way he said. Well, praise the Lord. Now, the resurrection is so important that uh, God gives a, a prophecy and vision to Daniel about it. And uh, the resurrection, as we said, includes not just the raising of bodies, but the changing of us who are still alive because overcomers are going to be alive when he comes. They're not going to die. And that's now, I mean, this time in which we live, this century, he's coming back. And uh, you don't know scripture if you think that's setting dates. I'm just quoting Jesus' own words. I know it's repetitious, and I run the danger of being repetitious saying this again, but <laughs> I'll do it anyway. Luke 21, 24 says, When you see Jerusalem restored to the Jews, then he says, that generation will not pass away till everything is fulfilled. He says, when you see the fig tree putting forth leaves, look for figs. They're right behind it. And the figs are your redemption draws nigh. He didn't say you're going to be raised from the dead. He says, that generation will be changed. Paul just said it here. He says, we'll not all die, but we'll all be changed. So I'm going to be changed. I'm confessing that. Amen. Because I'm going to be a part of that army that's going to be caught up to meet him and changed and brought back. To do what? To minister to this dead church that's in tribulation. To bind up its wounds. To bring it into perfection. And to set up the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's waiting for us to believe it before he can do it. So let's, let's pray we get a hold of it. So resurrection includes the changing, the catching up and all. Not just the little doctrine. I mean the little idea of dead being raised. That's just a part of it, you see. So you keep that in mind because we may not always say it. And it'll help you not be confused too. Because sometimes I'll just switch over to talking about, you know, the uh, rapture or something. And the uh, meaning of that resurrection. You know, the doctrine of it. All right, now the first three verses, he introduces uh, the whole subject. Now, I'm just going to deal with the passage in order, skipping only one passage and coming back to it, but uh, Paul has, by the inspiration of the Spirit, set forth all, just about all we can know this side of the grave about the resurrection, or this side of eternity about the resurrection. So the first 11 verses sets forth the historical fact of Christ's resurrection because your resurrection are, remember, you're catching up and changing. See, when I say resurrection, I mean the whole process. Whichever you, you need is what you get. If you're dead, you're raised. If you're alive, you're changed. Well, he sets forth Christ's resurrection because until you can see and accept and know about that, then you don't have any because ours is based on his. If he isn't raised... And a demon told me once that Jesus didn't die. Uh, because, and so this is, a, this is Antichrist uh, uh, that denies the resurrection of Christ. Why? Because then you, you don't have any salvation. You don't have faith. You don't have anything because it's all hinged on whether or not Christ died and was raised. So he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures. Now, before you can set forth the truth of the resurrection, you have to set forth the truth of his death. And so he died not by accident. He wasn't a martyr. He didn't die in vain. He died for us according to the scriptures. It had already been foretold. Where? Well, Isaiah 53 is a great passage in the Old Testament. He died according to Isaiah 53, as he said. And then 
he sets forth uh, the resurrection of Christ and the witnesses to it. He not only died according to the scriptures, but a lot of the, but uh, but uh, but he was raised according to the scriptures, and a lot of people saw him. He was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So his resurrection is according to the scriptures. Where? Well, Psalm 16:10, among other passages. That's the Old Testament witness. Now here are living witnesses, living in the time of Paul. He was seen of Peter. That's one. Then of the twelve. That's two. After that, he was seen of 500 at once. That's a pretty good witness, isn't it? There's three bodies of witnesses, of whom the greater part remain unto the present, although some have died. So if he, he's simply saying, if you don't believe it, go ask them. He said there are almost 500 of them still living, who saw him after he had died, raised again. And after that, he was seen of James. That's his brother, the Lord's brother, who wrote the book of James. I mean his brother, his half-brother, literally. Uh, because Jesus had no earthly father, but it's his brother. Uh, there's, what's that for? Then again, he was seen of all the apostles. That's five. And last of all, he was seen of me. Six. Six at least there, different sources of witness. One born out of due time, for I'm the least of the apostles not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God I am what I am. He got hit by one of those divine arrows. <laughs> and his grace was bestowed upon me, but not in vain. Praise God. When the Lord shoots you and uh, you have a sore mortal wound as a result of him shooting with one of his arrows, it won't be in vain. So as a result of his past persecution of the church, I labored, he says, more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but it was the grace of God which was in me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believe. <clears throat> now, he begins to set forth the implications of the doctrine of the resurrection, or the truth of the resurrection in the verses which uh, follow from 19 through, uh, or 12 through uh, 19. He's raising the question, uh, did Christ literally, actually, rise bodily from the grave? Well, what's, what depends on the answer? Look what depends on the answer, whether or not you believe in the doctrine of the resurrection. Now, uh, we're just setting this forth first because there are people in your churches, wherever you go, unless it's an exception, who do not believe in the bodily resurrection. Now, let's see what if they don't believe what the consequences are. First of all, if they don't believe in the resurrection, then, uh, then Christianity is a lie. Now, if Christ, be not pre if Christ be preached that he arose from the dead, how say some of you that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. You see, if Christ isn't risen, then we're preaching a lie. Secondly, verse 14, your preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. If Christ be not risen, then our preaching is worthless and your faith is also meaningless. Verse 15, another implication is that all the apostles are false witnesses. Yea, and we're found to be false witnesses because we've testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised up night, not, if so be that the dead rise not. What's another implication? If the dead rise not, Christ be not raised. Another implication in verse 17, if, if he has not been raised, you're still in your sins. If Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain and you're yet in your sins. So when anybody comes along with this idea of spiritual resurrection and not a bodily resurrection and that Christ uh, rose spiritually and not bodily or they deny the doctrine of the resurrection, as many do, uh, then you tell them they're still in their sins. Why? Because Romans 4.25 says he was raised for our justification. You're justified. You thought by his death, it says by his resurrection you're justified. You see, your death put away your sins. Covered them over. His death, the blood of Jesus. 
But friends, a death without a resurrection, you're still in your sins. You know when you were justified? When it came forth from the grave. You Well, maybe we better read it because you make scriptural statements that are strange to the Christendom's ear today. People think you're making it up or that you're a heretic. Romans 4.25 He was delivered for our sins. That's his death. But he was raised for your justification. You were justified by his resurrection. That's why resurrection is so important. You're still in your sins. For him to die for your sins and not be raised, you're still in your sins. That's how important resurrection is. If there's no resurrection, there's no gospel. Just the, the, whole, the whole message is the resurrection. So don't let anybody sit in your presence or within your hearing and deny the resurrection or try to spiritualize it. You get them straight right now. You've got an obligation. You say, all right, then you're still in your sins. I'm still in my sins. Uh, uh, the apostles were liars. Uh, our faith's in vain. And all that trusted in Christ die, who died, verse 18, are, have perished. He's, there's another implication. Then they also that are fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Another implication, verse 19, that if he, if he isn't raised, then we're wasting our time. In this life only, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, then we're of all men most, most miserable. Isn't that the truth? That's why he goes on to say in uh, verse 32, if he's not raised, then let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. I mean, why not? Just live it up. He says, verse 32, let us eat, drink, and be merry if there's no resurrection. Well, so the next time somebody uh, denies or tries to pervert the doctrine of the resurrection, just take them 1 Corinthians 15. You've got about six or eight implications there of what it means for you to have a, a weak or a wrong view about the resurrection. So all of that is preliminary. Uh, and some more here that's preliminary to get to the resurrection itself. We're going to skip uh, some verses here because I'm going to come back to them when we deal with Revelation 12. Uh, just to show you what I mean. But now is Christ risen, verse 20, from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. <clears throat> For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of, of the dead, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward they that are Christ that is coming. So right away, you've got more than one resurrection again. You've got Christ was the first, then he says those are his that is coming, and Daniel 12 spoke of another resurrection. Revelation 20 speaks of two resurrections and so forth. So, But we're going to skip this and come back to it because it's, it's really the uh, summation of the whole thing the resurrections. Now, <clears throat> uh, skip down to verse uh, verse 29. He's still dealing with implications of the resurrection. He says, well, why, if there's no resurrection, why are some of you baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? Why are then they baptized for the dead? Now, what's he talking about there? Well, <clears throat> Uh, again, as you read early church history, you find that many, see, many, many thousands were martyred. And some uh, would confess Christ, for example, and never have time to be baptized because water wasn't always as plentiful like it is today. You didn't have a baptistry in every church. And so some of these would stand in for them, be baptized for them after they were martyred. Now, Paul doesn't say whether they approves it or not. He's just saying, if there's no resurrection, then why are you being baptized for the dead? You're just wasting your time. He's giving all of these arguments for the truth of the resurrection. <clears throat> uh, whether, whether or not uh, they were scriptural in this is beside the point. He's just showing that, that because they believe that they're going to be raised, and they said, well, they only confess Christ, and the gospel is go preach the gospel and baptize these believers. But I'm not suggesting it isn't all right either, because the martyrs uh, had the spirit in a way that uh, uh, it's just beginning to come back into the church. 
And it also shows the importance of baptism. I want to say, friends, uh, that baptism is important. You're not saved by water baptism, but you're not saved without it. That's what the Bible says. You see, it isn't the means of salvation, but you've got to believe the whole gospel and obey the whole gospel. If you haven't been baptized, be baptized. If you've been sprinkled or poured, you haven't been baptized because the word baptism means immersion. It's never been translated. Bless the old King James translator's hearts. They sprinkled, so they didn't dare translate. They, they translate everything into English except baptism. And that's Greek. Every time you say the word baptize, you're speaking Greek, whether you know it or not. And if they would have translated it, like a rarely a few versions will, it'll say, Go ye therefore make disciples of all nations, immersing them into the name of the Father, into the name of the Son, and the name of the Holy Spirit. So uh, they were baptized from the dead because they believed it was important. Now, certainly those who had failed, were not able to be baptized, didn't, it, it wasn't essential for them. Like the thief on the cross didn't have to be baptized. But if he was not on the cross, he needed to be baptized. I mean, why, might as well get with it. I'm a former Baptist, and we don't believe baptism does anything to get you wet. That's what we were taught. But, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's important in that it's obedience to Christ. But then after the Holy Ghost comes, and uh, he begins to show you things, there's more to baptism than just it being important. Yes, there is. If it wasn't, he wouldn't say do it. So, uh, get baptized. Christian church isn't too far off when they baptize you the same Sunday. <laughs> that you confess. That's what they do in the New Testament. They don't wait right away to baptize you. You read Acts chapter 2, you read Acts 19, you read when Paul got converted, arise and be baptized, Paul. He didn't say, well, when you get around to it, we'll find some water here one of these days and give you a little sprinkle or something. If you, We know you're a busy man and all that. Now, the Lord didn't send me to baptize. Find somebody to baptize you. I mean, when we have baptismal services, I'll be happy to do it. But uh, as Paul said, he sent to preach the gospel and... Uh, I'm not trying to, to get candidates for baptism. In fact, some of you already asked, and uh, we trust we'll be holding baptismal services again soon, but it is important. Well, he says, that's why you're baptized from the dead for the dead, because you believe they rise. Then he says again, verse 30, why do we stand in jeopardy every hour if the dead rise not? He said, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus. I die daily, for after the manner of men, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. What advantage is it me if the dead rise not? He says, why am I going through all this trial and tribulation? Why are you, some of you, going through? Let us eat, drink, and be merry. He didn't say be merry, but that's what he means. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. But be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He says, anybody that doesn't know the resurrection of the dead is a scriptural truth taught all the way from over in Genesis, and it is through revelation, the resurrection of the body. Then he says he doesn't have the knowledge of God. Remember, that's what Jesus told the scholarly Sadducees. The Pharisees were, were the had the emphasis upon uh, religious observances, the Sadducees of his day were the scholars, religious scholars. And when they denied Matthew 19, the doctrine of the resurrection tried to trip him up with that old saw about if a man has seven wives and <laughs> no, a wife has seven husbands, they all die. Whose husband is she in the resurrection? He says, you show you don't know the power of God nor the scriptures. They were trying to trip him up. How could there be a resurrection if... Uh, uh, and all of that. Well, anyway, that's what Paul says. You don't have the knowledge of God. Now he comes to the interesting part. Not the other wasn't, but <laughs> we've been leading to get to the resurrection, the nature of it. There, somebody raises two questions and he starts to answer them in verse 5. Some will say, actually, should be translated, some of you are asking, Two questions. How are the dead raised up? 
and with what body do they come? Well, <laughs> he answers the first one, says, Thou fool, that which you've sowed is not quickened except to die. Now he's going to begin to answer them, and he shows them. First of all, uh, the nature of this resurrection uh, body, he says, that which you plant is just bare grain, that isn't what's raised up. You know, people raise all these questions, how can this body be raised? Because... Uh, if it lies long enough in the dust, and usually, and it always has up until now, and Christ's getting ready to return, it goes back to dust. So they're saying, how in the world can you get a, that body raised back up? It disintegrates. And what of those destroyed in fire? Where they are the atom bomb, where they're completely annihilated in a matter of a split second, are blown to bits out uh, at sea in a naval battle. How do you get all that back together and raised? Why well, said, thou fool? He says, uh, he says, that's the nature, first of all, of resurrection. You have to plant something like a seed. It has to die first. He says, that which you sow is not made alive except to die. So that's the mystery of the seed. You put it in the ground, uh, the, the seed doesn't produce a plant. No, the seed has to die to produce a new something that doesn't even look like the seed. So what you're going to get isn't going to look like what you've got, but it'll be you. And you'll be recognized as you because your personality is the spirit and doesn't die. But he says, that which you sow, verse 7, is, is not the body that shall be. That's just the bare grain, this old body of flesh. But it may come up wheat or it may come up something else. We don't even know what's going to come up. Now, he said it, I didn't. <laughs> so don't look at me. <laughs> you don't look at me like, I, <laughs> like, where do you get that? Well, I just read it to you. Well, verse 38, God gives it a body as it pleases him, and to every seed his own body. Look at it. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another fishes, another birds. There are celestial bodies. Now get it. There are terrestrial bodies. Celestial, the heavenly bodies. Sun, moon, earth, stars. I mean sun, moon, stars. Terrestrial bodies, the earth. But the glory of the celestial is one thing and the glory of the terrestrial is another. Now some may have, you see, one glory and some another. Not may have, they're going to have. And a lot of it, a lot of it, a lot of it, a lot of it depends on your faithfulness right now. And not what you were six months ago, but what you are now in this end time, hearing the message and going on with it. Deeper life, crucified life. You see Daniel, where you reread it, 12, 1 to 3 said, They that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars. The ones who will be raised that don't turn many to righteousness are not going to shine as the stars. They'll shine. <laughs> you know, like, uh, all you can stand is what you'll get. But some are going to shine as the stars. Well, that which you sow is not what's going to come forth. So quit thinking that uh, you're going to see me or I'll see you as we look now. It'll be so glorious, there's nothing in comparison. But we'll know who it is, just like Peter, James, and John knew who Moses and Elijah was, and they had lived a thousand years before Peter, James, and John. How did they know who they were? We're talking not about bodies. If they had to see the body of Moses and Elijah to recognize them, they could have never recognized them because they'd never seen Moses and Elijah. So something comes forth that's so glorious and carries that same personality with it that everybody knows who it is. 1 Corinthians 13, Then we shall know as we are known. You just know. Like, uh, just by way of illustration, uh, it comes to mind when I was praying the other day and the Lord gave me this vision, I knew right away what it meant. I didn't have to ask you. I knew. You just know. That's the way I'll know you. You won't look like you. Do now. But it'll be you.
more glorious than words can describe. But there's various glories. A celestial, like he says, the uh, uh, stars far outshine the earth. The earth doesn't have any light. It'll outshine the moon. The moon just reflects the sun. So he says some will outshine others. Now that's scripture. You wait until we get the whole thing. Don't come just once and say, where did you get that? Where do you get all the teaching on the judgments and the rewards and all? You're going to find out there are rewards for the faithful. Uh, that, uh, and some are not going to have any rewards. They're going to have nothing but the glory of salvation. And that's precious. But he never encourages you to settle for the least, but for the most. Well, there's one glory of the sun, verse 41, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star differs, there it is again, from another in glory. He's teaching you about the resurrection, the new body. Now, the nature of that new body, whether whatever glory you have, it'll be glorious. Don't worry about mine outshining yours, or I, I'm not going to worry about yours outshining mine. I'm going to be faithful, and whatever I get, I'm going to be perfectly content with it. That's the bliss of heaven. If I was, were envious or jealous of you because you outshined me, it wouldn't be heaven. But we're saying now you can make the difference. <laughs> now it's time to make sure there's a difference. But when we get down to verse 42, he's not talking about differences any longer. He's talking about the nature of it. So also the resurrection of the dead. It's sown, the body is sown in corruption. It's raised incorruptible. No sickness, no sin, no pain, no tears, no hot, no cold, no death, no decay. Praise God. It can eat if it wants. And it will eat because the scriptures say we'll sit down with Christ and he will gird himself and feed us. He himself in his glorified resurrected body when he just walked through the walls, the doors and windows being shut for fear of the Jews, he said, they thought they saw a spirit and they were afraid. He says, I'm not a spirit. This is just my new body. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He said, prove that I've got a body. And friends, this body is a body. As we're going to see, he calls it a spiritual body. It's not a spirit, but a body with your spirit in it, just like your spirit's in this corruptible body. He says, give me a piece of fish and a piece of honeycomb. So he ate it. And later on, he appeared to them the Sea of Galilee in this new body, and he was cooking dinner for them there while they were out fishing. Remember? Praise God. I feel the anointing just talking about it. <laughs> and so he ate again. So we're going to eat, but what you eat is incorruptible too. You see, when it goes in, <laughs> you don't need it. You don't need it to sustain you. You just eat it for the joy of it. Where does it go? Well, you leave that up to God. It doesn't come out. It just, it just dissipates into sweet aromatic aromas and perfume. Praise the Lord of heaven. Amen. I'm not making it up. You, you believe it. <laughs> Amen. Why? Uh, I mean, I'm not trying to be uh, carnal in saying it, but when Jesus ate, he didn't have to discharge it after his... <laughs> he, you have the power, you see. Uh, the new body can assimilate and it, it goes into purity, complete, utter purity. But of course in heaven, the th even the things you eat will be f of spiritual. So you don't even have the problem what to do with literal fish that you eat. Like... Uh, in that particular case. So it's sown in corruption, raised in incorruption. Here's another characteristic of it. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. Dishonor. Now, of course, it's subject to pain and disease. Of course, you can overcome that by faith, but still subject to it. Sometimes it's deformed. Sometimes this body is, well, it does grow old and skin ages and Hair falls out if you don't know what to do about that and all of that. I mean, it's, dis it's, it's sown in dishonor, but he says it's going to be raised a glorious body. Here's another characteristic. It's sown in weakness, but it's going to be raised in power. Now, friends, that word means what it says, power. It can do anything. No limitation. It has the divine power of God in it. 
The power to overcome anything, the power to be anywhere, the power to do anything. Just like Jesus in his new body. It is sown a natural body, physical. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a physical body, there's a spiritual body. Now here's what we have to see <coughs> that he's saying here, that it's a body, a body, B-O-D-Y, body made up of spiritual, M-A-T-E-R-I-A-L, material. You couldn't have a body if it was just something you could poke your finger through. If it was just filmy, uh, uh, some abstraction like a cloud, you know. Uh, that's a carryover from spiritualism. If you think that this is a body, he said to Thomas, who doubted, touch me and see. <laughs> this isn't a spirit. This is a spiritual body. It says, put your hand in the wounds. The wounds are there for eternity. Thrust your hand aside. It'll be there for eternity. That's his glory. You see, marks of the crucifixion. But you couldn't touch something that wasn't there. And yet he could do with it what he wanted. He could eat or not eat. He could go through walls, not go through walls, appear, disappear, be here, be in heaven immediately. That's the power he's talking about. It's going to be raised in that kind of power. You will to be in another universe. You're there. You, you, the thought puts you there. It's a spiritual body. You have the power. Oh, there's a realm, friends. You're, you're so much in the flesh. We are. I'll include me too. We are so much in the flesh that you talk in this realm it sounds like a myth or fairy tale, as a woman told me once. <clears throat> so it just sounds like a myth, fairy tale. Well, I said, praise God, it's true anyway. I wasn't talking about the resurrection, but the supernatural. She, I gave her that Baker's book, Visions Beyond the Veil. She, she needed deliverance, you see, and I was trying to help her to show if these things were true, they were still happening. Uh, how many of you read that book? Well, you know what I speak, that uh, without the Holy Spirit, it does sound a little far-fetched. With the Holy Spirit, it's normal. But it's, uh, it's, it's too bad that he has to uh, write this way. We ought to know about it without him having to write a whole chapter on it. But nevertheless, that's the way it is. He says, thou fool, verse 36, he says, there is a physical body, but he says that isn't what's going to be raised up and duplicated. He says there's a spiritual body that's coming back, coming forth. And as it's written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul, but the last Adam, Christ, is made a life-giving spirit. Howbeit that which was first, not first was spiritual, but that which was natural, which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And as is the earthy, so are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also which are heavenly. As we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall bear the image of the heavenly. So whatever Christ is, you remember John, 1 John 3, 2 says, We know not what will be like, but when he appears, we know we'll be like him. Over in Philippians uh, 3, uh, verses 20 and 21, it wouldn't hurt to look at that. Listen, Philippians 3, 20 and 21. He says, For our life is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working wherewith he's able even to subdue all things to himself. So he says, Paul says, like John says, that Christ, when he comes, is going to change, either raise us up and give us a new body, or change us in the twinkling of an eye that new one like his. It's not going to be something that is less than his. It's going to be what he's got. And you're going to be able to do with, with your new body what he does with his. That is to say, the body then becomes one with the spirit. It's a spiritual body. But it's not spirit in that you don't see it or can't feel it or it's not somewhere located. It can't be over there and here. It's a body. 
like your thoughts can be anywhere, you see. <laughs> Sometimes you can tell that. <laughs> but uh, it's going to be a body like his, raised in power. Well, <clears throat> then he continues uh, the showing the need now of having this new body. Uh, verse... Uh, Verse 50, here's why you need a new body. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom of God. So that new body will have no blood in it. It'll have no flesh, but it'll have, it'll have a spiritual substance. Because you see, this body is corrupt. He says corruption can't inherit incorruption because that new age is incorruptible. It's spiritual. And because it's spiritual, I know it's repetitious. Don't think of it as something that isn't literal and uh, material in the sense that it's spiritual material. It's an earth you walk on. It's a spiritual material now and a spiritual body walks on it. And because we live so much in the flesh, that's why you are straining to comprehend. You can't really comprehend, but when you're in the spirit sometimes and you have visions, you can, you can comprehend a little more how this can be. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now he's talking about all in Christ. This is the first resurrection. He's not talking about the other resurrections of the wicked and so forth. He's not even talking about the martyrs. They don't get raised at this time. That's where we see from Revelation. They get raised after the millennium, after the tribulation. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed into the incorruptible. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. You're mortal. You could die now. But he says you're going to put on a body that won't die. It's immortal. It couldn't die for all eternity. That means forever. If you could ever get around to the end, you wouldn't be at the end. You'd just be at the start again. You'd just go. <laughs> That's the only way you can depict eternity like a circle. You can't find where it begins or ends. That's God. He didn't start. He doesn't end. That's what we're going to do. Uh, it's going to happen to us. Once he created a body, breathed into it his own life, from that moment, that, that spirit continues. The wicked, that spirit continues in a state of punishment and judgment for the rejection of Christ. But the saved are given bodies to go with that eternal spirit. And the body is eternal to go with the eternal spirit. You see, he says this mortal will put on immortality. So, and this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death has been conquered. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, this is what we'll say then, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? For now the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Sting of death is sin. Sin gives death its sting. You see. But Christ took away our sins by his blood, raised for our justification. So he's taken away the sting of death. And even though some of you, I'm not going to say us any longer because we're in the last days. And it depends on your confession. I can't confess for you. But some of you may go through uh, the transition of death of the body, but you don't die. You can't die any longer, you see, because he's taken away the sting. You just make transition into the better realm. And then at his return, you're given the new body. So then you can cry, you see, uh, then where death, where is your sting? Jesus took away the sting of death. Sin is the sting of death. The strength of sin is the law. What's he mean by that? Uh, Paul, read, uh, read Romans 7. You'll see what he means. 
It says, by the law comes the knowledge of sin. He says, I didn't know what sin was till the law came. He said, since the law came, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. He said, sin got very strong because I saw I was a sinner. <coughs> and until you get the teaching, you don't find out how far you've missed God as a Christian. Either, do you? So you're better off not to have heard than to hear and go on and jump back over the fence, back into the pasture, uh, as we told you last night. Because time's coming, you're going to look for that strength in that word, and you can't find it. So the strength of sin is the law. That is, its ability to condemn and show me the nature is in the law. But thanks be to God through, who giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Well, I'm not going to say any more. He said it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, <clears throat> we thank you for the revelation that our hope is not in doctrines and churches, but in the belief of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. For in this belief is our hope of our resurrection, whether it be a literal bodily resurrection or uh, a change, that we know that we're all going to be changed bodily from the corruptible to the incorruptible through our faith in his resurrection. That we've been delivered by, from our sins by his blood, but now we stand in hope uh, because we were justified when he came forth from the grave. And we shall come forth from our graves, whether they're graves in the earth or the graves of these physical corruptible bodies, as we live at his return and are changed. We are, we're coming forth. And we thank you that uh, you have shown us the importance of this prophecy given to Daniel, that there's a time coming in the last days when the time of great trouble comes upon the earth, that the dead are going to be called forth, some to a resurrection of life and some to a resurrection of judgment. We pray that this is the hour that we make proper preparation for the right resurrection. Bless us now as we spend a few moments together in discussion and meditation that the Spirit of God will lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.